just right, referenced right. in the state court. They filed a criminal complaint on Tuesday, I believe it was, um, but it might have been Monday, in which they charged Mr. Thomas with a, a number of hate crimes, which can be heard concurrently with the state charges. Mm -hmm. We have a system in which you can be really? charged. Really? So you can be charged federally and you can be charged in the state court. There's no double jeopardy. Really? I didn't know that. And that's wow. why I'm bringing it up because most people, and many people might think there is, there's not. And you can be, be charged with something as a hate crime and you can be charged with something otherwise in the state system as you've explained it. So that's where Mr. Thomas is. At the, the bail issue is, is a bit uh, of a non-issue here, as you mentioned, $5 million bail. His mother is an RN at Lincoln Hospital, where she's been working as an RN for 20 years. His father is married to a Mormon in Utah, and I don't see them raising bail of $5 million anytime soon. Now, now I want to, you know, um, so when I mentioned that, um, I saw in the news that you were uh, representing this gentleman, a lot of people are like, wow, why is Mike Sussman representing this gentleman? Isn't he Jewish? Isn't his, his brother a rabbi? Why, how can he represent this individual? So the answers are, yes, I have a brother in Chicago who's been a rabbi for 30 years. So I'm, I am Jewish. Uh, but uh, as I have many cases in the region dealing with anti-Semitism, I've been a civil rights lawyer dealing with a, a range of issues, and I don't confine myself to issues that directly affect in a negative way the Jewish community or any community. Mm -hmm. My concern in this case, I was called by the pastor of the mother of Mr. Thomas, Pastor Wendy Page, who's a United Methodist pastor in Harriman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Sunday night, she got a hold of me a week ago tonight, mm -hmm and told me that Mr. Thomas was profoundly mentally ill, has been profoundly mentally ill for a very long time, had received Social Security disability insurance for his mental illness when he was in his mid-20s, he's now, as he said, 37, and that auditory hallucinations and other serious manifestations of mental illness have characterized him throughout. So as you said earlier, someone's talking about domestic terrorism, someone's talking about yeah. anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm concerned that the individual receive a fair trial, which includes use of mental health defenses where they exist and are well predicated, well premised. And rather than have a rush to judgment, what I thought was important was to get a complete picture of who the gentleman is and what in fact motivated him, if anything, if anything. Okay. So that's where we are. The, my, my religion plays no role in this, quite honestly, for me as a lawyer. Uh, it motivates me, if at all, to try to do social justice, and it's been my motivation for more than 40 years as a lawyer. That has no religious line, one way or the other. Well, I, I already knew the answer to that question, yeah. but I heard people mention it, and I just wanted to give you a chance to address it, definitely. Um, the, another thing, um, again, people like, if they're hearing now that he's been mentally ill for a long time, um, why hasn't there been efforts to give him help before now? Like, um, you know, why? Yeah, like, what, what's Kendra's role? Yeah. Well, what is what? Kendra's law. I keep hearing it. Why wasn't Kendra's law applied? And I don't, and I don't know what that means. Okay. So, well, let me try to explain it the best I can. But I want everybody to be very clear. I've had this case for a week. I've spent probably 80 hours this week on the case. Right. But I have mm -hmm. a lot to still learn, as mm -hmm. anybody would know about a case in this complexity. What I can tell you is that um, Grafton Thomas is one of those people, and he's not the only person like this, who's lived a very isolated life, as best I can tell. He's been sort of a, you can say it, a throwaway. His mother has deep love for him and has housed him for many of these years. But she works in, she lives in Greenwood Lake, which is the county you and I live in, Damon, exactly. in Orange County. Exactly. She works in the Bronx. She oh, commutes so three hours a day to work. She works 12-hour shifts. She works mm -hmm. five shifts a week. And he's home. He's essentially home by himself. 
Uh, he has no violent criminal history that anybody's been able to find. There are some very petty matters in his past criminal nature, but none of them amount to a hill of beans. And from what I could tell those people who knew him and know him, nobody saw this level of decompensation <laughs> before now. Um, I do think from speaking with him and from the psychiatric review I've had from one psychiatrist who's seen him and another forensic scientist who saw him, he has very serious auditory hallucinations, which is something that um, can drive someone in, in, I mean, to say crazy ways is not an exaggeration, crazy ways. Why no one did anything more is probably because he never did anything which suggested this level of, exactly. of, okay. of behavior. Maybe. However, quote unquote, crazy he may have seemed to some people, or, or a he merit, didn't act, on he it didn't like act that, yeah. in a way that gave people a merit or warrant to, to do more. And now, tragically, we're here. But from my point of view, as a civil rights lawyer, the last thing I want to see is the image of an African-American man, 37 years old, being portrayed as a domestic terrorist with profound anti-Semitic intentions, leading to all of the stereotypes that we have seen too frequently. Exactly. And okay. it, it, you, you, hit it, um, you hit it on the nail because of the fact that I... I, I am really um, appalled, and, and I think um, black people, uh, especially the Democratic Party, man, I, I, I really don't get Thank you. how we um, get played all the time um, by Governor Cuomo yep. for yep. him to um, push the political rhetoric when there is evidence that the man is mentally unstable, has, has mental problems. But Governor Cuomo is the same person that has closed all the mental hospitals in New York under, under his watch, which, which, which in the result um, are leading to a lot of mentally ill people committing crimes, not able to get the proper help yeah. and the proper watch and the proper medication and all that goes with with dealing with mental mentally ill people in New York State, and 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 just like you said, Mike, you know, they're going to try to make this this man the poster child for a lot of the other incidences yeah. well, that the, that are sorry, going on in New York. Well, well, what they did, they did a uh, homeland security, mm -hmm. you know, um, warned everybody in the United States right. of, of upcoming. Um, assaults, you know, in the Jewish community, right. and they highlighted this gentleman exactly. as this, uh, basically the scapegoat. Right. Well, you know, Damon, you and I have known each other for a, a decade, and we came together around the case called the D.J. Henry case. Mm -hmm. And the, the two situations obviously have profound differences, but what is similar is that when D.J. was shot, that day, the police chief said he was shot because he was running over two members of law enforcement. Exactly. Do you remember this? Yes. Mr. Alagno? <laughs> and the family came from Boston, from Massachusetts, in great grief, and this is what they were told. Mm. It's sort of, we were talking earlier, the official story about the killing of this gentleman in, in Iran. Okay? Mm -hmm. he, he poses an imminent threat. DJ exactly. was posing an imminent exactly. threat. Okay, exactly. now what did we find out? We find out he's driving at eight miles an hour. We find out that he's driving so slowly that a large man, a man as large as you once were, is able to <laughs> jump. <laughs> is, able, is able to jump on his vehicle, mm -hmm. control a weapon, and his vehicle hood is about four. And I have it in my house still. The car it's still in my house. Wow, four and a half feet is the hood. And he's able to grab on and shoot with the car moving. Right. And shoot three times and kill the man, shoot him in him each time. Right. And all I'm saying is the other police officer wasn't being run over. He was trying to shoot that police officer. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So all I'm trying to say, and I don't you know, I don't I don't bring this into this lightly. I've thought a lot about whether there's a connection and the connection may only be in my mind. But the connection is that before we know 
we come to these judgments, and the exactly. judgments become defining of the situation. Exactly. You have 90,000 Jewish people, and this is an interesting story, getting together and celebrating the end of the reading of the Torah, which is a, every seven years you read the Torah you, from beginning to end. Right. A, a person close to me was setting up that day for their event at MetLife Stadium. And no one was allowed to bring a cutting knife, which they need to set up, into MetLife Stadium. Okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. you know, all these tech people have to set up everything. They need cutting knives to set everything up. They're not allowed to bring in the knife because this man allegedly used a, a machete-type knife and, mm. and injured right. seriously several of the people. This is what's alleged. Right. So we can't have pandering and hysteria. And that, to me, is very important because it begins to stereotype people all over again. We don't want you in our midst. Right. Because we don't know what you're capable of. Who are you? How are we defining you? Right. You and and, and not, not only that, like, where was Governor Como when the police officers called Kenneth Chamberlain a nigger and killed mm -hmm. him? Mm. Where is the hate crime? Right? Where is where is the terrorism? They didn't call that terrorism. And that was terrorism. They that was police. That man they, they, they terrorized him for an hour and then went in, kicked in his door, and they shot him with a bean bag. They shot him with a they tased him, bean bag, and then killed him. Nobody called that no justice. terrorism. Terrorism. And and then the DA had the nerve to say that they used the nigg word nigga to distract him. Right? So so we, we constantly see the double standard. Um, when it comes to black victims and black suspects in the state of New York under Governor Cuomo. I, I wanted to, and I just before, I wanted to go um, piggyback off what you said. The minute I saw that you were representing him Sunday night, because I think you, I weren't, you weren't there, you weren't, uh, yeah, legal aid or something for, for the Saturday for the, um, for the initial court. Um, but the minute, the, 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 the minute I saw you, I called Damon, and we was like, we have to get you on because mm -hmm. this is a time where, and in and, and, and this, they, they, they criminalize, you know what I'm saying? They, 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 they us, whether we're the victim, whether we're not, whether we're the assailant, you know, they, they use the media criminalizes us. Um, and I wanted you to be able to, you know, speak. And we had the opportunity to get you. So yeah, I, I wanted to take advantage of that and bring you to the people before politics radio, sir. Well, you know, Mr. Woodson, you know, I appreciate the chance, and I don't back away from it. Uh, I have a very close friends who, who operate a Mexican restaurant where I sing every Friday night my karaoke, <laughs> and we've been doing it for a couple of years. And yes, you can come up there. I'd be happy to hear you. Happy to hear you. You won't be happy to hear me. <laughs> but anyway, you know, on, on Friday night, a gentleman who's very close to me said to me, you know, you're going to make a lot of enemies with this. And I said, you know, I've made a lot of enemies with everything. But that's not the standard. Lawyers can't be putting their hands up and saying what's the most popular thing to do. I said to people, if you had a surgeon and a very gentleman or a woman who committed allegedly a very heinous crime needed your surgical assistance, are you going to withhold it on the theory that they're a bad person? Really? No, not really. That's not the way we do things. This gentleman needs avid legal defense and honestly needs his story because that's what happens in mental illness cases. The story has to be explained. And as I said before, we're still learning a lot about his life. And, and honestly, Damon, you know, to go back to something you're averting to, and I was telling my children this the other day, some of them, we have this profound racism in the society, but we don't think it has effects. Right. <laughs> How absurd. And what the effects are are going to be differential, depending on who the person is who's exposed to it and what they're exactly exposed to. But racism has so many forms. Right? Exactly. Exactly. No, so many forms. Your parents are deprived. Is that going to have, what impact will that have on you? This is not to apologize for what somebody does, but we have to have an explanation. We have to have an understanding. We can't just say, this, this is just what happened. Why did it happen? What were the influences? And when you start picking that, that <coughs> apart, in this particular instance, you'll see, you'll, you'll, you'll see all of it. You'll see all of it. And, and that's what... 
for me, that truth-telling process is the most important thing. You know, when I did the Yonkers case, we had a 92-day trial about racism in Yonkers. People say, was it a success? I say to them, read the transcript. Know the racial history of the city. It's there to know now. <coughs> it wasn't there to know before, except yeah. if you experienced it. Right. And then you experienced your part of it. But the exactly. whole picture is exactly. in that 700-page decision by Judge Sand. A lot of the picture of how people were steered in school. Mm -hmm. That people couldn't get the b most basic opportunities, whatever their intellectual ability, mm -hmm. how their housing patterns were so steered by government. So all of this is about truth telling, and I'm going to try to bring that same thing to this case. However uncomfortable it may make people, it makes them uncomfortable. Right. They want to just blame someone. Let's get over with this. Exactly. Exactly. But what, what are we going to learn from that? What, exactly. what of our listeners, um, Charles Stern, a good friend of the show, and he's a, a guest co-host sometimes. He said Cuomo is starting to look bad on this. I'm glad Mike Sussman is defending this guy. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate what you have to say. And, you know, what, what Damon said a minute ago, I just want to correct in this way, and I don't mean it, it, it mm -hmm. as criticism of you. The movement against mental hospitals started in the 1960s and 70s, okay, okay. large-scale mental hospitals. It's okay. not something that Cuomo started. So just be mm -hmm. clear. Okay. It, it's not, his father was in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> his father, no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> it, started, yeah, right. it started with something called Willowbrook. Okay. Willowbrook was a lawsuit brought by people who were confined in very inhumane conditions in okay. our state mental facilities. And there was a tremendous need, just like in the bail reform situation, right. where we're dealing with profound inequality, whereas you know, we have people serving as pretrial detainees longer than they would serve exactly. if they were convicted. Exactly. And that's because they're poor. Exactly. So there's a, oh, there was a reason to de have what we call deinstitutionalization. But the problem is, there was supposed to be a real safety net Mm -hmm. run by counties throughout the state, funded by the state, so as to deal with individuals who had profound problems. Monitoring, accountability, are you taking your meds? Right. I went to this gentleman's shack, shack in Wurtsboro, and I found years worth of untaken pills in pill bottles. He was prescribed new 30, 30 pill scripts each month. He didn't take any of them. They were all laying around. Anybody who would have done a home visit would have said, where are exactly. your pills? Exactly. Why are you taking them? Exactly. And the answer is no. Exactly. So we need a system that's in place. And yeah, I think Governor Cuomo, quite honestly, three terms is enough. You know? Yes. I mean, yes. it's enough. Yes. I mean, and, and, and see, the Democratic Party, which depends, and I, I say this respectfully, and he depends on people of color to keep him where he is. Exactly. He, he stitched together exactly. a coalition of people yes, he did. to keep him, and that's a critical yes, part did. of his coalition. And I say to him, you're not really representing that group of people in our society for many of the reasons you're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, but see, we, we, get, we, we get caught in the Ali shuffle, and, and, and politics gets in the way of, 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 of justice, you know, and, and they, they, they talk about... Um, that they're giving justice to the needy and the poor, but they're they're, they're literally um, playing politics, no different than um, the the loss of the Mount Vernon Hospital. Yeah. You know, is politics. You know, I mean, they, they could have saved that hospital, but they didn't. People before politics, people before profit. Exactly. Exactly. Right? exactly. Well, you just changed that exactly. one word to explain Mount Vernon Hospital. <laughs> right, right. Well, it, exactly, 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 exactly. And 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 really, I don't I don't think they could do anything with the hospital. It's a done deal. They bought the new property. Um, from what I was told, they already got the money. They got the forty four million to do what they got. I, I can't see them doing anything. Maybe trying to add a couple of services, but that's not in the budget. Um, so you know, um, uh, we'll we'll see. We'll we'll, well, we'll they're, see. They're, they're going to have a town hall tomorrow. Anybody who has questions about, or you know, they're supposed to be providing answers. And uh, who is the hospital going to be there? I, I don't know. If if Montefiore is not going to be there, it's a waste of time, mm -hmm. right? Because if if they're not saying it's a, it is a waste of time. People that's listening, if the hospital is not going to be there to answer questions about what they're doing, you have wasted your time. And to listen. Listen to the community. They answer questions. Like Ex exactly. People what people's concerns are. Exactly. We went through this in Port Jervis where they closed the maternity center at the, at the, the Port Jervis Hospital. 
We went through it nine years ago, and Cuomo was governor, and we challenged them in court. And the Department of Health approved of that closing, even though there was no maternity center within a half an hour away, and there are a lot of poor people in Port Jervis. And now, just close it up. And that was it. People before profits. That was my slogan there. Oh, wow. Lorraine. Yeah, so anyway, they're having a, if, if you want to go, they're having a town hall tomorrow, and they're having a rally Friday at the hospital. But, uh, uh, but they're, they're but, wait, the hold on, hold on, hold on. Why are you rallying at the hospital? when it's clear and i hope the unions are hearing this i hope the leaders are hearing this the only person that can change it is governor cuomo so what are you rallying at the hospital for it should be buses going to cuomo's office it was clear it was clear months ago when they announced it and and i put it in the article when we spoke to charles Barron, and he said it straight it's cuomo it's cuomo it's cuomo why are you rallying at the hospital? See, this is the Ali, this is the political Ali shuffle using people because they fail to address. I don't care who doesn't like what I says. If you're not taking it to Cuomo, you are not doing anything. Distractions. Well, there, there is a portion of uh, planned on, they're going to release, you know, the the people that are in the um, organizing committee, uh, they're, they're informing the residents tomorrow. They're having a press conference on Rally Friday. They are having, um, planning to go to Albany, take buses to Albany. They're going to explain all the things that, how residents can get involved and what they're doing, what information that they've obtained so far. And, and come back to the residents. Hopefully that's what tomorrow's the, a step. In other words, he's saying tomorrow's a step. It's a detour, maybe. So that's what tomorrow's supposed to be. So, <laughs> but, but, the, but the only thing I'm saying is, <laughs> any, anybody, right, right, right. Right, anybody that is in state government, your your senators, your, your assemblymen, already knew in September that it was Cuomo. Like, like this is not, like, like if you're in state government, right, you know that the buck stops with Cuomo. He's the one that will be able to change it. Now we're in January of the next year, right? After they already bought the property, allegedly already got the money, the state is well, six, half of it. well, the state is six billion in the hole, right? Six billion in a hole. Do you honestly think they're going to change the deal? And where are they going to get the money from? Because because if that was the case, your senators, your assemblymen, your congressmen, your 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 DC senator should have got money years ago, back in 2010 when it was reported that the hospital was in dire needs and that's why they took on the contract with the with the Westchester County inmates so they could pay the damn bills. Okay. So so all this that they're talking about is nonsense and they're and they're playing good people that care. And they're playing politics and they're Ollie shuffling when they could have handled this a long time ago. Explain it. Explain how a little town up up, up the river can get $84 million for a brand new hospital, 30,000 people. We got 70,000 people in Mount Vernon. They get, they get $44 million in an in a outpatient clinic. Somebody's doing their job up there. And, and what did the mm -hmm. lieutenant governor say? What did, what did she say? Health care is the number one priority. But it's not priority in Mount Vernon from the state. But nobody's saying that. Then nobody's saying that. You know why? Because they pissed Governor Cuomo off. Mount Vernon ain't getting jack. So, so they're so they're doing the dance. They're doing the dance. Come on, man. We should have been talking about this months ago. But yet they want to blame Andre Wallace for signing paperwork that he didn't sign. Lyndon Williams. So come on, we we we're doing our we're doing our people dirty. We're doing our people dirty. Um, John Carlos said, Damon, more people should be saying that. Um, he said, you're on point. Charles Stern said, Damon's on point. Hospitals are regulated by New York State. Mm -hmm. Cuomo uh, the, is the decider. Um, there was a few other. <laughs> Someone said, Mike Sussman should defend the black man from Long Island accused of killing 
the white Italian jogger. That dude is <laughs> mentally ill, and he looks like he doesn't know where he is. What, the mayor? No, I'm saying that's a jog, the, the jogger the person, slayer. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the person who, the man from, uh, the black man who, who um, is accused of killing the white Italian jogger. Are we, are we oh, oh, you talking about that? Listen, I don't think he did that, man. I really don't. Well, that's what he said. He said the guy, that dude is mentally ill and looks like he doesn't know where he is. Um, shot, um, a couple of people tuned in. Charles Stern, uh, and Nas Duncan. Um, Judge Karen Bess is tuned in now. Uh, John Carlo, Jack Poon, uh, Aisha Taylor. What's going on? Uh, Dawn C. Wright said, good evening, AJ. Good evening, Damon. Uh, Nesto Acosta, DJ Nesto from Virginia, Kevin D. McGill, uh, Carlton Beckford Dozier, a uh, big supporter, uh, Patricia DeLuca, he's my former editor at King Magazine, um, Robin Elizabeth, uh, I think I got everybody, Rob, Jerio, <coughs> <coughs> I'm not sure if I pronounced yeah. it right, yeah. Joanne Cappadani, um, Kevin Bunch, so that's yeah, it fucked with Tumbo Muhammad, Robert Brown right Jr., right now, right now, uh, right now, so Drew, Lynn Whitley, um, and everybody else who was tuned in. Um, Eddie so, Ortiz, Maria Morero, and Erwin Raspis said, Kudos to the attorney for representing a black man as a Jewish man. Now that's American. Mm. Yes, yeah, Mike, let me let me ask you a question. You've been, you've been on the forefront of a lot of civil rights cases um, and an activist. Is there a, a need for a resurgent of true activism in New York? Mm -hmm. um, um, be, be, because, you know, it's, it's almost like we're going in circles. You know, I, I haven't been in it, in it as long as you. Let me just say a couple of things to you, because, I, of course, the answer to your question is yes. But there are some, there are some caveats that are important. Mm -hmm. What we have fallen victim to often is the politics of personality. Mm -hmm. And unless and until we can focus on issues... And, and have persistence to follow through those issues and work together on issues that may not be your first priority, right, but right. that are important to others in the coalition, we get nowhere. Right. So we have a lot of people who are interested in one issue, and unless everybody's interested in that issue, then they are out. Exactly. The only way to have a broad coalition that can make change in our state, I was, I was meeting yesterday with New York City Housing Authority tenants down in, in the Chelsea neighborhood. And you know what I'm finding? New York City is privatizing public housing, oh, right? Privatizing so it. Yonkers. Okay, at a time when there is a dearth, a shortage of housing for the, the really poor in the society, mm -hmm. what they're doing is getting rid of that housing which was intended for them. Exactly. There are so many, you're talking about hospitals in, in Mount Vernon, there are so many issues and, and a coalition which is true to bringing all of them together. You know, when I was in Yonkers in the 80s, I litigated in schools, housing, police misconduct, municipal employment, voting, because there was there had never been an African-American or a Latino elected in the city or the county. We had to bring voting rights suits, which we did, which got districts, which allowed yeah. Herman Keith, Joe Burgess, and on and on and there. Andrea Stewart Carson's, that's the district that I created, that she eventually yes. got elected in. As a county okay? legislator, And yeah. she's gone on. Thank you. Keith and Thomas went in. I mean, yeah. Davis went in at the Exactly. The they went the same time in 1985 as a result of our lawsuits. But what I'm trying to say is you have to have a consciousness about the, the synthesis, the connectivity of all these issues. Mm -hmm. And a movement to be successful has to knit together right. the people who care about bail reform, with those who care about housing, with those right. who care about education, right. health, to see that these are all manifestations of the same consciousness of deprivation. Right. Okay? Now, you need leadership of that. And and the leadership of that can't, you can't get involved with a million crazy nitpicking nonsense. You need somebody who can articulate, or some bodies who can articulate that and get out with a program that is so comprehensive as to create the umbrella that will work. Mm -hmm. Now, 
you know, we don't have that. We, you know, we don't have it. That's, that's what I see as a huge problem. I don't care the race, the gender, the sexual orientation. I don't care who the person is. Right. But we need some people who can project that and be magnets for others to join. Right. You know, right. and what we instead have is selfish individual agendas. I'm going to work on this. I'm going to work on If you're not on that, then... Well, you know, many of them started that way, saying that, but they've lost their way. You know, because they got, a lot of them got bought off. Yeah, yeah got exactly. I mean, they you know, got they, jobs. In Yonkers, <laughs> that was the scene from one of those... Uh, one of those movies from the black plantation. Oh, oh what, what happened to them? They all got government yeah, jobs. All the black leaders in the street, yeah. and they all got government jobs. Yeah, <laughs> but that's exactly the point, and that's why I say you have to have a dedication and an independence and an understanding that it's not about you. Right. It cannot be about you. It cannot be about your self-aggrandizement and your advancement. It has to be about moving this whole set of issues forward. There's no better time. I mean, honestly, because it's... You know, I don't mean to say this on the air, but the you know what is hitting the fan. Right. On so exactly. many issues. Exactly. You, you can say it here. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't, want, I don't <laughs> want to get into that habit for the microphone. <laughs> but the point of it is, in you know, I do think this is a time, but you know, it has to be galvanized, and and there has to be a dedication, a tremendous dedication and persistence. It's not you. You can't be. You can't be satisfied with, you know, 40 hours a week of it. It ain't going to make it happen. No. <laughs> Exa exactly. You're, 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 abso you're, you're absolutely right. And, uh, and we need churches. We need unions. We need, you know, in Inwood, where I just won that upzoning case that stopped the upzoning of that neighborhood where they're trying to gentrify the neighborhood. I went into state Supreme Court supported by a huge coalition of people. And the state Supreme Court judge said they annulled the upzoning because they're trying to gentrify one of the last affordable neighborhoods, largely Dominican neighborhood in, in, in Manhattan. And, you know, when I went down there for the, quote, victory celebration, it was at a church. And I remembered back to Yonkis in the 80s, when the minister, the ministerial alliance, was one of the backbones of what we were doing. And then by about 1988 or 89, it broke apart. It broke apart. Okay? It, it, yeah. <laughs> and, and then the ministers were all literally fighting with each other, we could not get the degree of unity that we needed to persist. And and, and then one day, I, I wasn't even in, 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 in politics yet, but I, while that was going on, I walked into this small diner out of the way little place, and who do I see? The top guy, the top pastor that was fighting, sitting there having a cup of coffee with the mayor at the time. Well, that's what usually happens, yeah. you know, instead of saying thus, you know, um, thus says the Lord, they say, thus, can you, what, can you cut a check? Yeah, that's what right? it is. You know, and... and well, we, we, we had um, some big places, big places talking about um, some of the churches won't speak because they get money from the county and they were not going to speak up against the county. Well, well, well that's wanna, it too. Yeah, they won't, they're not going to speak up against it and ruin their, you know... Their, yeah, their Pete, Head Pete. Start goes through churches. Mm -hmm. All sorts of programs go through churches. They don't churches pay taxes. compete. They, they don't, don't pay, pay taxes. Their churches compete. Who's really? going to get these programs? Exactly. And, and exactly. So, so there's a lot of intersectionality that cuts people off. Exactly. But you know, we have to transcend all of it. And, you know, look, that's that challenge. But you're 100% right. And it's not about the law. It's not about lawyers saving the day. Without movements, the legal system is dysfunctional. Movements are what... Are what sustain progressive lawyering. And any lawyer who doesn't understand that, who's a progressive lawyer, is has a, a heroism complex that's misplaced. It's not about the lawyer. <laughs> we have too many, I've said that before, we have too many moments and not enough movements. Good. Um, well you know, put. everybody will fight for the moment. You know what I'm saying? And then it's dead. You know what I'm saying? Then we're off to something else. You know, it, like you said, it takes, if you look at the history of civil rights and everything else, there was large coalitions, large movements, and, and, and as Bob always says, there was great organization. That's what he says. There's one thing we're lacking is organization. Um, well, that's why a case like movement. this, to swing it back, though, that's why a case like this where you're setting uh, this African-American man as a symbol exactly. of anti-Semitism, exactly. and you're setting back the chance of coalition building because you're building on the stereotypes. In the, in the, in the primetime civil rights movement, African-Americans and Jews stood shoulder to shoulder. That's true, historically. That's true. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it's not to say other groups weren't involved, they were. But those two groups, if you go back through the history, that's what you'll see. So all of this stuff, all of this rhetoric, is a way to weaken the chance of that solidarity reemerging. And it has mm-hmm. to reemerge for it to be successful. All right, I'm going to leave you guys alone. <laughs> you know, I can go on and on and on. You know, hey, man. On and on and on. No, yeah. it's all right, man. It's this all right. Show, mm-hmm. This is the show to do it. And our audience needs to hear this. Exactly. This is a perfect exactly. way to start off the year. Exactly. You know, everybody's talking about celebrating their New Year's and all that, and uh, New Year's uh, resol- uh, resolutions, and, 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 you know, this is the perfect way to start off the year, informing the year, informing the people, um, and the people need to hear that. And they need to hear it from more than just me and Dave. <laughs> sometimes it's out here. They need to hear it from other people as well. You know, and, and, uh, and, and, and Mike, you bring, you bring, you know, you bring history to the table. Yes. And, and yes. he's telling you how old I am. <laughs> yeah, I look bring, that old. You bring that's history. You bring history to the table, <laughs> and and that's great because you know we're we're living in a in in a in a cell phone um, age, and you know we're living in a fake news age. Um, we we're, we're living in an age where you know a lot of young people. Um, that are in positions don't know the struggle. Like, you know, a lot of black law enforcement, they don't know the struggle, how it was to get blacks just to get in the police department, and the struggle it is still today to get blacks on police departments throughout Westchester County and in in, 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 the, in the northern counties. Um, so, so you know, we have to continue the struggle. We have to continue to talk, you know, to literally talk about it, to, to, to get people to understand that, you know, we still have to fight. I well, I wanted to shout out to Ms. Uh, Sister Best to us here before because she's doing something important. I mm-hmm. hope that the program is meaningful. But in, in today's day and age, what has to happen is people have to be sitting in rooms together. We have to transcend the electronics of it all. The electronics right. have a role, right. but we have to sit and talk with each other exactly. in broad, in broad exactly. coalitions. Everybody's got to come over to the table and try to figure out what the priority at that you say moment is, but with a foresight as to what the other moments are going to be. Right. And, and I think, honestly, up in Erin County, I've been trying to do that on many, many issues over 30 years, 35 years now. Get people talking, coalition building, working together. And, you know, we had that, honestly, in Yonkers in the 80s. I mean, and, and, and to some extent before I was there in the 70s. You had, you had people really relating and visioning and then taking the steps to make those visions happen. And that was being done in a coherent and, and continuous, persistent way. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's what draws me to the struggle, the continued belief that maybe someday in my lifetime, in the remaining few years, I'll see it again, reemerging. Right, right. right. You, got oh, man, yeah. you got a compliment on the, um, from one of our um, friends of the show, uh, Marvin Church. He said, Michael Sussman, you have been my hero due to my late mentor, Haywood Burns. Yeah. Haywood Burns is a marvelous human being. Thank you for that. And, uh, yeah, Haywood Burns and I broke bread many times and is a wonderful man. A lot of the people, who, you know, aren't here, and this is what you talk about history. Part of the history is remembering people like Tom Atkins, who probably don't even remember who nobody knows who he was. He was the first African-American elected to the city council in Boston ever. He became the general counsel at the NAACP after Nathaniel Jones took a seat from Jimmy Carter on the, in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And Thomas Atkins, whose literacy, writing literacy, you wouldn't want to emulate, in a courtroom, phenomenal, power, came from Elkhart, Indiana, died at an early age. A tremendous hero in, in bringing these racial issues, justice issues, to many courts around the country. And there are so many people like this. You know, I think back to, to Benton Harbor, one of the most disturbed communities in Michigan. You probably have heard of Benton Harbor, Michigan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's probably the poorest three communities in America. And yet you go to that community, as I did as a civil rights lawyer, to try to deal with their school problems. And you meet people who've been in the struggle for 50 years in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Literally. Every day, Mary Defoe got up, and her major purpose in life was to find the child who was being disregarded by that school system and sit and advocate for that one child. And she did it for 50 years. Mm. These are the kind of people yeah. that I had the opportunity to meet and work with all over America. And they're, you know, 
you can't help but internalize, hopefully you can't help but internalize and gain strength from what they did. And they didn't do it, they didn't do it through affluence, many of them. They didn't do it with anything. They did it just because they needed it to be done. Right. Let, yeah. me, let me ask you a question. Like, um, you talked about a lot of the, um, you, you mentioned a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, Marvin said you know, you've been a hero to him and mentioned Hayward Burns. Yeah. For people watching, you said we need to get back more into um, activism and all that. For someone watching that wants to do that or has a question, how can they get started or... You know, they, 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 they're inspired by you. What words would you give them? You have to coalesce with people in your community. Identify people in your community. Identify the issues in your community that matter. Every one of the communities we're talking about, unfortunately, there still are many, many issues that matter. Absolutely. And, and find like-minded people, and as I started saying before, sit with them. Don't just email them. Sit down in a living room, sit down at a diner, and start talking. That's how this group called Fight Back NYCHA started in New York City. I met with their leadership yesterday. They started because they saw this privatization happening. They're common people. They're every person. They're not, it's not that they have a degree from Harvard Law School. You don't need that. Don't, don't be deterred. Don't be deterred right. by somebody says to you, you don't have this, you don't have that. When mm. I was 19 years old, I was, I was senior counsel to Jimmy Carter in 1973 running for president of the United States. I didn't have a degree from anywhere yet. I went to the Democratic National Committee and it was hollow. What you find is many of these institutions are hollow. What I mean by the word hollow is they're not as the bench is not as deep as you think. It's like the Philadelphia Eagles now playing quarterback is is McCowan. Who's McCowan? Wins got hurt in the second half but Josh McCowan. And the Jets cut him. How deep is it? They're going to try to get to the Super Bowl. Think about it that way. Who's, the, who's on the New York Knicks? Who would be on the New York Knicks if you lose another 10 pounds? Okay. point I'm making is we think about these institutions as so mighty. I fought against all these institutions, whether it's IBM, you name it. I've sued them. People can fight back. Nobody is that powerful. Yeah, right. that's right. And that it's, the, it, it's the illusion. Mm. It's the illusion that they're that's so right. powerful that yes. keep people sitting in their chair. Yes. It's the illusion that they don't know enough and that that's there's right. so many experts who know more than they do that keep them sitting in their chair. That's right. Yeah. Don't mm. buy into all these illusions. You're living your life experience, and from that experience you can understand both the sources of oppression and the sources of inspiration. Mm-hmm. And if you gather with others, you can do anything. I've seen that in our county, in community after community, where I, I played a role, I've been honored to play a role, trying to help people catalyze and then move forward. So, you know, call me, I'm happy to talk to you, but that's not the end all be all. Right. Talk to people in exactly. your own communities who are working and get, get with them and don't feel there are barriers to getting with them. Nobody's so above everybody else. Right, that's right. Right? Right. And, and that's why I voted for him for New York. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that's why I voted for him. That's, I just want to say that. No. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Didn't get many votes, but I appreciate yours. But I, I did that because I felt, again, as you were talking about Cuomo a minute ago, uh, I, you know, I'm not concerned that his, his opponent, my opponent, was an African-American woman who, who I understood why Mr. Cuomo wanted her on the ticket. I we, understood we, the I, deal. Uh, okay? those, look, you those know? who understand politics mm -hmm. knew why she was put there. Okay. And, you know, I have nothing against anyone personally. I don't like personalizing things. But the problem right. is that you have to look at that administration and its corruption. The failure ever to really ultimately pass any significant campaign finance reform in the state, despite 12 years of talking about it. Where is it? Okay? On and on and on. In every issue, we see the same thing. Environmentally. And this is critical to our communities. We have a, a policy in New York State of not having fracking. You know what fracking is? Fracking is a way as de of developing right. natural gas that's right. very polluting. It's terribly polluting. Right. So we say we're not going to frack. But we're going to now import all this frack natural gas <laughs> to new fossil fuel plants all over our state. And yet we're going to cut down by 50% dependency on fossil fuel in 20 years. How? The plants have 50-year life lives. It, none of it makes any sense. Right. I'm challenging him on that issue. I'm in court on that issue because I feel our futures are so tied to the need for better environmental policies. 
And there's a brother you should get in touch with and get on your show named Merton Simpson. He's a, he's a county legislator in, in Albany County. And he is spearheading progressive environmental movement in the Good. African American community Good. in Albany. Good. And that's an issue we're not talking enough about. Right. You know, you're part of this planet too. Right. And of course, people may have more immediate concerns. I get that. But people have to gravitate towards environmentally sensitive solutions. It's right. an important part of the movement. And African American, Latino people have been so underrepresented in the meetings I've gone to all around the state on oh, that issue. Oh, it's oh, terrible. Yes. It's as if the, the planet's not for them, too? Please! <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I, I really recommend Merton Simpson. His father was a major American artist and had a big, okay. a, big, a big studio in Manhattan before he passed a few years ago. And Merton is really spearheading. He was the lead plaintiff in Simpson versus State, where I represented 4,700 African American and Latinos who challenged this racially discriminatory, the state promotion system for civil service. Mm. There was a discriminatory test being used, which we struck. And we ended up getting $45 million for that class of people who had been discriminated against and not been able to get promoted in New York State throughout all the civil, all the agencies. Mm. And all the people that have benefited from that did not know nothing about that. Like you said, exactly. Don't know. exactly, exactly. That they're, like, in civil service, a test mm -hmm. to move up in ranks, someone fought to make sure... Black and brown and Hispanic people were able to be treated tre treated fair. You know, I mean, uh, to get to um, what, what they call, um, to appeal to psychological. Someone fought, you know, that you can appeal to psychological because they, they saw that they were failing black and brown people more than any more than anybody else. So I mean I mean we have to understand we did not get here in a vacuum that people fought and you got in your position and you have to do something with that position that you have. You owe it to do to, something. To, 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 right. You owe it to uh, you owe it you owe it to other people, man. And, and, yeah. I, and I always say, you know, a lot of these situations situations like the conditions of Mount Vernon and other cities of this kind they are in those situations because they accept the conditions the, the where the other municipalities in this county would not accept these conditions, would not accept this from the state, would not accept it from the county, they would not accept it from their rep, their representatives, nowhere else would any other municipality accept that, that the MTA has closed 10 bridges or however many mm -hmm. bridges for decades and not fixed them. Like, you have to fight. You Like, nobody's going to give you anything. Anything that has ever happened, people have fought for. The, 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 the ones that can fight, sell out. Yeah, but that, that's what I'm saying, right? You got all these bridges closed with the MTA, right? The lieutenant governor runs for re-election. Elected official supporter. People come out and vote for her. Nobody questions them about the bridges. Like, like, what, what are we doing, people? Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? It's just a lack of disrespect, you know. And and it's it's just I, it's, it's mind blowing how we could just fall for the okie doke and and not say, you know what? I want my community respected like every other community is respected. We deserve this. We, see, we, there's we no competition it. for your vote. You have to get back to the basic situation that you have. All of mm -hmm. these things, to me, derive from that. You mm -hmm. have no, quote, Republican Party in this state worth a damn. And you don't. You right. have no yeah. third party really worth a damn. I yeah. ran on the Green Party line, but the Green Party's not organizing. They don't organize. Exactly. They run candidates. You have to organize. Exactly. And I told them you got to organize in the communities, you know, year to year, moment to moment. And then, then maybe you could win an election. They looked at me like I was crazy. We run elections. What do you mean you run elections? On what basis? We're not doing anything exactly. to serve the people. Exactly. Remember those words. What? That's what Huey talked about. Serve the people. Exactly. That's the exactly. basis of politics Left politics, progressive politics, is about serving the people. Yeah, That's the basic them, issue. Them. Okay? But did you see the article? Now they're trying to raise um, for the minor parties. Yeah, of course, get, hundred thousand. Yeah, exactly. to, try, to try to stop them at all, which exactly. is a waste of their time because those parties are going nowhere anyway. Frankly, <laughs> they were going anywhere. I can understand them making something of it, but it's not. It's a joke. But the, the real, the tragedy. We're coming back to your point, though, Damon, is that the people you're talking about do not actually have a choice unless right. they make exactly. the choice exactly. that's what we were talking about before about starting a movement which could provide some real exactly. choice exactly because right now where are they going 
Exactly. You either join the club or you're, as, you, as, uh, as Woodson said, you're out. Exactly. You, you know, you said it yourself. If you're not going to participate with us, you ain't going to get any goodies. Exactly. Right, right, right. Exactly. So that's the justification for going along. Right, right, right. But the problem is, you're, you're, you're still at the bottom of the, you're still at the, bottom of the, the, the line. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Yeah. I don't want to take too much of your time. So, 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 I want to give you. I want to give you. Yeah. I want to give you um, um, another opportunity. Anything that you want to address specifically to this case and your um, candidate. I wanted you to be able to use you know your time here to whatever you need to do as far as that's concerned. Well, the main thing about the case, I'm just asking people to keep an open mind and let the evidence that's available about the gentleman, his conditions, his circumstances, and whatever happened that night come out. Uh, I, you know, I feel there's a huge amount of pandering, and that pandering, which takes a lot of rhetorical forms, is, is very destructive of due process. It's very destructive of our legal system and the rights accorded there. And I want Mr. Thomas to have a fair opportunity to use the defenses that are available and that are justified in his case. And obviously it's not for me to decide that. I'm not the judge. But I, I think that has to come out. Does, does, is there still a possibility, could you, you said, is there still a possibility for him to have those federal charges upon him? They're the on domestic? him. They are upon him. They indicted him on those charges? They didn't indict him. They, they, they filed the complaint. They, but they will indict him on okay. those. Mm -hmm. that's oh, that's sad. Him. So, and I've said to them, why don't you hold off until you can review all these. I have thousands of pages of meandering writings by this gentleman where there's no reference to anything anti-Semitic at all. It's just honestly an incoherent well, mass. You know, why that's important is because I've been reading the about all the pages about anti-Semitic and Hitler and, and, and all of these things. That's that's what that's what's in the media. I, I, well, that's what they're one, that's one what they're little thing, and, they, and that's all. And then let, let me tell you up. what I saw in in literally reading about two thousand pages. I saw a picture of a swastika, and this is what was written next to it. This was once a symbol of prosperity, which is a true statement mm -hmm. that became corrupted into a symbol of destruction. That was a pretty lucid statement. That's not anti-Semitic, right? Not anti-Semitic. No, right. He went online, apparently, or browsing about various German Hitler and this and that. I, If I saw in my review of these pages anything anti-Semitic, I would tell him, yeah, he, that would make part of his obsession, his mental illness. It, in what I have seen, it's not there. Now, the day I heard about the diaries you're referring to, Woodson, I asked for those diaries from the federal prosecutors. I said, let me see them. I want to see them. I still haven't gotten them. So I can't comment on them directly because I haven't read them. Right. But I can tell you that we've, we went to this place before the feds got there, before they had a search warrant, <laughs> and I got the material there, <laughs> and I got boxes of material, which now I've turned over to them. Right. Okay, which they're going to copy and give back to me. And I'll tell you, going through that material... And I'll make it available to anyone to come look at it because I want dispelled the notion. And I want elevated the truth. You see, you say facts, fake news, and you're you're hundred percent on that, Damon. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point, all of us, it's not and this doesn't have anything to do with anybody's race or origin or anything. We're all at a point where it's very hard to know what's true and what's not exactly, true. Exactly, exactly. And we all have to try to, to search within ourselves to have the discipline to want to know. Because we don't want to know, <laughs> then right. we're all we? We're nowhere. Just throw up the throw up the dice and whatever it is, it is. There's no is no purpose left. I mean, I have seven kids, and the major inspiration for me is I want them to have a world where it does matter that there is something that's true and not true. Not that anything is true. Now, right. that's different from saying you perceive something, someone perceives something. There is racism. It's not right. just your perception. Right. I see it every day in my work. What does it look like? It right. looks like people being subjected, as you said earlier, to double standards mm -hmm. all over the place. 
and without good and legitimate explanation. There might be an explanation for treating something different, treating someone different. The fact they happen to be African American wouldn't necessarily make it racist, right? Yeah. But what's the reason? What's the rationale? Right. And when we start unpacking that, we can make a judgment. Exactly. Okay? As you said about Mr. Chamberlain, who I think about a great deal, and his son. You know, we have a person who's treated the way they were treated, devalued. That's an important devalued. word for us. Mm -hmm. We have to focus on that word, devalued. And criminalized. Mm -hmm. Those are two key words, yes. because that devaluation is what separates the treatment. Mm -hmm. Someone else gets the benefit of the doubt, they get the benefit of, they're a piece of you-know-what. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Have a good night, everybody. We, uh, uh, we thank have, you, we man. One, we got one more question from right. um, our co-host who's not here, Dr. Bob Bassett. Okay, Dr. He said, Bob. Mike, one of the most frequent objections to the mental health defenses is the perception that it would give the defendant an unacceptably light punishment. Is this true? Even if a mental health defense was successful, what type of penalty would your client receive? So there's a bifurcation or a division in our law. If someone is declared mentally unfit and that condition is a constitutional condition, meaning a condition that's in, in, inherent in their person, they're going to be institutionalized and they're going to get treatment until and unless, and usually it's literally 20, 30 years. Right. The focus is not punishment as much as it is directly mm -hmm. treatment. Mm -hmm. But but institutional, as you're saying, yes, they did away with a lot of the mental institutions, but is they still have Marcy, they still have Mid-Hudson, Mid and these are places where the mm -hmm. psychiatrically deranged, if you will, who are charged with criminal offenses go and stay. Right. So it's not viewed, to answer the gentleman's question, as, quote, a punishment because they're viewed as not technically responsible in a legal way for that act because of their mental lack of mental capacity. Right. But on the other hand, they don't go free and walk around the streets either. Uh, exactly. Well, I think that's what he wanted to do. Absolutely he not. He wanted to get that out. Now, that's, that's not there. That. And, right. and that's not what happens. Right. They, have to, they have to be in a situation where they're confined, but the confinement is viewed by maybe the same, but it's viewed as different. It's viewed with an, the, the desire to assist them in dealing with their mental disease. Because correctional facilities, Damon, to correct me if I'm not mistaken, are not equipped to fully handle and treat um, these individuals, right? Like, no, not yet. But but we have now um, this year they um, they're starting new our new training this year is how to supervise the mentally ill. We have transitioned um, a, from a long way in into now dealing with the mentally ill, understanding the mentally ill, and um, um, correction officers is probably um, the only law enforcement agency that everybody is taught how to deal with mentally ill. And now we're starting um, a class this year um, supervising the mentally well, ill. Well, I, I do want to shout out to those at Westchester. I was in Westchester on Friday morning mm -hmm. visiting with Mr. Thomas. And I must say the staff that I interacted with mm -hmm. was tremendous. Mm -hmm. Everyone there, from the visiting area into the visiting room, I'm saying the reception right. area to the right. visiting room, each and every person seemed to me, at least, to be sensitive to what was going mm -hmm. on, uh, not making a big joke out of it, and understanding that this gentleman, plainly on the face, had some pretty darn serious issues. So mm -hmm. I congratulate them for that sensitivity. And often we criticize these individuals we accuse them of things, but in that case, at least, I was very impressed with the attitude mm -hmm. they were they were demonstrating. So, mm -hmm. any any um, uh, I know you were saying that you were pushing for a competency hearing. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Is is that scheduled yet, or do we have anything? I I on on Monday again, the day after I got the case, I wrote to the district attorney who was then leaving, Tom Walsh became the district attorney on January 1st, mm -hmm. and, and now has this situation in Rockland County. Mm -hmm. He just took office, right, you can imagine. Right, exactly. This is what he, he comes into office with. And I wrote them asking for agreement that he be evaluated for a 30-day period pursuant to the laws of the New York State so that we could get fuller evaluation, but they never responded. So I retained, essentially at my own expense, a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist who would, who would come to some conclusions about this gentleman who's right. a very well-known forensic psychiatrist in, in, in this area.
So the so he's currently being held in Westchester. And there's there's, there's um, that's that's the that's the most up to date. He's currently being held, and and my doctor did see him for several hours on Friday. We'll go back to see him this week, and I hope that we'll have a preliminary report at least, which will allow the court and give the court some basis to believe he needs to have the evaluation. Right. Whatever the people's position may be, I don't know because mm -hmm. they haven't responded to my my efforts. Mm -hmm. Right. Any questions, Damien? Well, 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 you, you know, our door is, is open. Absolutely. You're my neighbor, man. If you need me for anything, brother, <laughs> just let me know, man. I'm, yeah. I'm only 10, 15 minutes away. All right. well, it's great let to see know. you again, Damien. Yes, definitely. Even though I'm not seeing all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Same with you, Lorraine. I'm going to say that to a woman. But, <laughs> but you raised it first. Congratulations <laughs> to you, too. Thank yes, you. Nice yes, 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 to see you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. My and, uh, pleasure. Doors, Good luck with everything. Good our luck doors with are case. always open. Open door policy. You need us. You call us. You know how to contact right. us. Thanks a lot. Good to see you. Thank you. Take care. Drive Drive safe. And um, I, I, 